The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. mind, 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 mind. Welcome to the real world. I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Truth Frequency. This is your host, Chris Geo, and I'm joined as always by my lovely co-host, Cherie. And it is April 26, 2010. Joining us in just a few minutes is the legend, David Icke. And this man needs absolutely no introduction, so it's going to be an absolutely amazing show. He's got some great info to go over with us, and um, we'll see where the conversation takes it. I mean, we have no questions. We're, it's completely unscripted. We're just going to see where the conversation goes. I'm excited. Me too. I, I'm so excited Me about too. this interview. Um, ever since the inception of Truth Frequency, we have wanted to have this man on our show. And um, so we're finally having him on, and we are so excited to be having him on. It, um, I, I don't even know where we're going to go with the conversation, but I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, let's cut to a quick intro, and uh, then we'll bring David on the line. We'll be right back. This is Truth Frequency with Chris and Cherie. soul has no limitation. wider perspective, so much of what we do to each other must have the rest of creation shaking their heads in disbelief. The fact is that someone born in the United States is not more special than someone born in Mexico. Someone born in London is not more special than someone born in Liverpool. Someone who is uh, white is not more special than someone who is black. They're just vehicles for the consciousness to experience. If you go down to the seashore and you pick up a droplet of water in your hand, how can anyone say that that droplet is any more or less special than all the other billions and trillions of droplets you see in the ocean before you? It's the perfect environmental and human assassin. It insists every year that we take more from the earth even quicker, turn it into even more things, sell even more things, consume even more things, throw away even more things, to worship the real God of the modern world, economic growth. How can you buy or sell the sky? We do not own the freshness of the air or the sparkle on the water. How then can you buy them from? Every part of the earth is sacred to my people, holy in their memory and experience. We know the white man does not understand our ways, 
He's a stranger who comes in the night and takes from the land whatever he needs. The earth is not his friend, but his enemy. And when he's conquered it, he moves on. He kidnaps the earth and his children. His appetite will devour the earth and leave behind the desert. If the beasts were gone, we would die from a great loneliness of the spirit. For whatever befalls the earth, befalls the children of the earth. Glorious there. And welcome back to Truth Frequency. This is Chris and Cherie. And uh, on the line, we have the one and only David Icke. And on this show, this man really needs no introduction. But Cherie, why don't you go ahead and read us a quick little bio before we bring David on the on the line? Sure. Uh, David Icke is a former professional soccer player, a journalist, a network anchorman with the BBC, a spokesman in the 1980s for the British Green Party, and since 1990, a full-time investigator into who and what is really controlling the world. Many have dubbed him as the most controversial speaker on the planet. They used to laugh at him, but now they come in the thousands to hear him speak all over the world. He is the author of 16 books, no, 17 now, and among them are And the Truth Shall Set You Free, The Biggest Secret, Children of the Matrix, Alice in Wonderland, and the World Trade Center Disaster, Why the Official Story of 9-11 is a Monumental Lie, Tales from the Time Loop, and his latest book, Human Race, Get Off Your Knees, The Lion Sleeps No More, which is going to be an amazing book, so I suggest everyone out there order pre-order a copy. Absolutely. David, do we have you on the line? Uh, I hope so, Chris. Cherie, I'm here. Great, great. Thank you so much for joining us, first and foremost. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, you know, you are such a great speaker that um, you, the floor is yours. <laughs> we, we, we don't even want to ask any questions. The floor is yours, sir. Tell us about your new book coming out at the end of this month. Yeah, well, it's it's called, um, as you say, uh, Human Race, Get Off Your Knees, The Lion Sleeps No More. And there's a, a fantastic painting of, of a lion on the front, um, which symbolizes for me the real human race. Not the suppressed one that thinks it's uh, Ethel Jones and uh, Charlie Smith. The real one that knows its its consciousness, having an experience in this reality, and can tap into the infinite love, knowledge, understanding, wisdom of the universe. Uh, and it's 700 pages long, nearly um, 355,000 words, uh, 325 illustrations, and 32 pages of original color artwork, symbolizing the uh, the themes of the book and it's a massive work of, of dot connecting and that's really what I've been doing for this last 20 years I started on this journey 20 years ago uh, in the march uh, just gone uh, and it's only when you connect the dots between apparently unconnected people events subjects uh, that you can start to see the picture because so many things are happening in the world, um, and there are so many interesting things going on about what is reality and so many uh, questions and areas of research. And in and of themselves, it's like, oh, that's interesting. But it's only when you fit them together that you see the real significance of them and, and why the world is as it is. And it's very clear that the global society and the the national societies in different countries if you like are specifically structured for the end of human control and human suppression and this has been going on for eons and i, I go into the book into um uh, the 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 bigger picture of what's behind these bloodline families that i've been exposing all these years and, and others are exposing uh, uh too uh, who sit on top of the banking system, the political system, the transnational corporations, the oil cartel, the biotech cartel, the pharmaceutical cartel, the media cartel. Uh, it, 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 um, it looks at what's behind them and, and what the, 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 the bigger picture of this uh, really is. And it, it's, it's been like um, this last 20 years going down the rabbit hole. And you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and... If you if you don't stop and think, OK, I've, I've, I've sussed it now, I know what's going on, then you keep going down and you keep going down and it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And the whole foundation of it and the, the, the foundation themes throughout the book is that we are infinite consciousness, uh, all that is, has been and ever will be. 
having an experience, but we have been manipulated to believe while we're having that that experience that we are that experience. Uh, it's like uh, someone on the moon in a spacesuit thinking they are the spacesuit. Suddenly, their uh, potential is dramatically limited, and that's what happens to us. And, and it's been specifically structured uh, to to make us look in the mirror and think that's who I am. That's that's all that I am. What I can see in the mirror, and and it's uh, been used to brilliantly take infinite consciousness having having an experience and turn them into uh, uh, turn that into a in so many cases around the world uh, a herd of human sheep and so what i'm saying in the book is um the lion sleeps no more the the memory that we are consciousness needs to wake up and 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 i can tell you over the 20 years that i've been doing this it is waking up all over the world and we're we're in a fantastic time now because it may look and i understand that that the control system is getting more and more power more and more control uh, but it's in its death throes it's not going to seem like that for a few years, but it's in its death rows. It's it's like a cornered rat throwing everything it can to hold on to its power, but it's 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 going, it's going to fall because we are in the the point. It's another area of the book, um, another theme of the book. When I uh, first had my awakening, the first book I ever wrote, uh, wrote it in 1990. It came out in early 1991, and it was called The Truth Vibrations. And the truth vibrations referred to something I was picking up, even in those very early days. In fact, it was a major theme in those early days, that there was a vibrational change coming. Uh, it was part of a uh, uh, of, of this planet, this reality, moving from one vibrational state to another, a much more enlightened one. Uh, and and you, you can see the the uh, the ancients uh, in in the the um, in the Indian region, for instance, they talk about going through different yugas the mayans talk in central america talked about going through different cycles of, of of what we call time different cycles of or different epochs if you like and it's a common theme in the ancient world of this secular nature of what we call time and it's broken up into into sections um and 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 you move through very different experiences as it moves through its cycle and what i'm saying in the book about that is that uh the black holes actually resonate the base frequency of of this reality uh, because the, the scientists have found that this this galaxy has a, a, a massive black hole at its center and and what i i call the time loop and what the the ancients called the cycular na nature of time the yugas for me as i've explained in the book is the changing nature of this vibration coming out of the black holes which stimulates different information coming out of the suns in this case our sun in our solar system um, in the form of photons and this this photon information this basic uh, uh, structure of light changes as the vibration changes in coming out of the black holes and draws out out of the suns a different level of information a different base information construct and we are tuning into that through what I call the body computer, and we, we, we are being affected in our sense of reality by that information. And what we're, we're at the point of now, and it's what I call the truth vibrations, uh, is that um, vibrational uh, state being resonated out of the black holes is changing. Therefore, the information we are receiving in the form of uh, photon energy from the sun is changing and we're moving from one epoch, a very suppressed, what people might call dark epoch of suppression and ignorance, and we're now moving into a new epoch, a new period of this time loop, if you like, where um, we, we, we're going to see uh, dramatic uh, uh, changes in human perception of self and reality, much, much more expanded levels of consciousness and awareness. And so what we're, we're, we're facing at this point is this truth vibration transformation, which is demonstrably happening all over the world. I've seen it over 20 years. Couldn't talk about this stuff 20 years ago. They laughed in your face. 
Um, but now, you know, it's incredible the number of people that are, that are opening their minds to things they would have rejected by reflex action uh, uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, because it's, it's exponential, this change that's going on. And what the control system's doing, which because it, 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 it comes from a, a greater level of, of, of knowledge than we, we, we have, humans, because it suppressed us from and stopped us getting that knowledge, but that's changing now, it has been planning to try to put the lid on this change at the key point where the change was taking place. And so this, as I've said many times in the last few years, this control system with its uh, uh, manipulation of the, the body computer through food and drink uh, pollution uh, and additives, through electromagnetic pollution and all this other stuff, and harp and all this other stuff that it's, it's, it's doing from, from the frequency point of view, all the efforts to suppress us in multiple ways, uh, the microchip, which is the jewel in their crown because they want to externally manipulate the body computer so it doesn't pick up these uh, truth vibrations, these higher, higher uh, uh, levels of awareness that are coming in so fast now, the, con the, the control system is, appears to be seeking more and more control. And, and on w uh, w one way it is, but it's real motivation. All this stuff that's being thrown at us in, in, in the last few years up to this present moment uh, is to try to hold on to the power this force already uh, has had up to this point and the truth vibrations are going to uh, sweep away. Um, so it's, it's, it's an amazing time we're in, one of tremendous transformation as we move from one era of human perception and experience to a very different one. I personally believe the pineal gland has kind of like an antenna. Is this what's You're picking right. up? Is yeah. it? Okay. It's kind of like in the movie Avatar, uh, the way the Navi were connected to their spirit of their world was through that little tail thing. Our our way of connecting with the spirit or the ether of, of our world is is through the pineal gland. I, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, it's interesting. I've got I've gone into this in the book. I mean I've gone into everything in the book it's so big. <laughs> but um for instance, fluoride in, in the water, um it and of course in toothpaste and all this other stuff, it it, it, it affects, it calcifies the pineal gland, you know. These people are not um, doing this from a, a state of, um, you know, throw everything and we'll see what works. They, they understand how this level of reality works. They've just kept it from us. And they are systematically targeting uh, the areas that will keep us suppressed and keep us in ignorance. And it's very interesting you should bring up that uh, movie, Avatar, because um, I'm not saying this is what the producer uh, was intending. I don't know where he's coming from, but wh when I looked at that, it was an unbelievable um, symbol expression of what has happened to humanity. I, again, I go into this in the book as well, because if you, I, I say uh, that uh, the, this planet has been taken over by a reptilian race operating in the shadows, which has tremendously um, advanced technological not spiritual my goodness me no but technological knowledge and they've used it and they've used the knowledge of how this reality works to uh, and they've used their hybrid bloodlines um which the ancients long talked about um and, and uh, uh, i've um detailed over the years uh, in, in in a tremendous amount about um how these bloodlines work and how they came to be, the interbreeding that created them. And these are the bloodlines that are at the top of, like I said earlier, the banking system, the political system, the transnational corporations, the, the global cartels. And they are middlemen and women, what, what were perceived in the ancient world to be demigods, part human, part gods. In other words, part human, part these reptilian entities. And if you take in the Avatar movie and you switch it around and you take the the blue people, to be humans as they were before the uh, predators arrived, if you like. Mm -hmm. And you take the humans that arrived in their spaceships on that, on that moon in Avatar and use their technological knowledge and everything to take, take it over. You, you take them not to be American military as they uh, uh, were, were uh, symbolized. It's, it's the New World you, Order. Yeah, you take them to be the, the, that reptilian race that arrived eons ago, mm -hmm. and, and and that's what that's that's so symbolic of what 
is happening. And the American military, uh, symbolized there in the um, uh, the Avatar movie, I would say, uh, symbolizing the reptilian race, and the British military and all these other militaries, they are vehicles, although the soldiers don't know it, they are vehicles for this predator race that's taken uh, the planet uh, over by by stealth, by using its um, its middlemen and women to to do it, um, and that tells you something because uh, it means that they can't do it directly; they have to do it through um, middlemen and women that look human, and it's um, it's it's interesting that there's been so many uh, movies over the years that have told this story in different ways. Um, and, and and with the passage of, of, of time, uh, become more and more um, accurate because there is there are many people working within Hollywood, people like George Lucas, for instance, who are insiders. They're not coming from just imagination when they do things like Star Wars. And there was there was a man who um, who, who worked with um, with Lucas on Star Wars, some of the Star Wars, some of the special effects. A man called John Carpenter, and he produced a. Uh, a movie back in the 80s, I think it was. It was a kind of what you might call a B movie. It was called They Live. And I saw it long, long time ago. And it is so accurate in, in how it portrays what we're experiencing. But for people that haven't come, come across it, you can, if you go onto YouTube and put They Live, John Carpenter, and you can see it in, you know, in sections. I, I really do recommend it because the story it tells is the story we are experiencing. What happened was, um, it was set in the future, and that future, funnily enough, was about now. There was a massive economic uh, collapse, and people were living in tents and corrugated iron makeshift, um, you know, kind of villages in cities on wasteland. I mean, of course, what's happening now in America? Uh, and and uh, one character who was a builder, he, he, he wanted to get a job in the building trade. And there was very few jobs for anybody, but he he got this job, and and the, one of the other builders took him back to the corrugated iron uh, uh, tent kind of uh, city, as they call them, uh, on some wasteland because he had nowhere else to stay. And across the road was a church, and things were happening in the church that took this guy's uh, you know, thoughts and thought, what's going on? There's something strange going on. And then some, someone who created this makeshift television uh, uh, in this, this little tent city, um, the television program was broken into and there was a man saying they're here they, they've got control of us we don't realize it and then it would get cut off and he, eventually there is a, a raid by the police state on this tent city and everyone gets uh, has to run away and some of them get arrested some of the people from the church get arrested and and and, and the the character the builder character gets away and he comes back the next day when it's all calmed down and he goes in the church and he, he's looking around for what was going on in here. What, 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 what's the, the big deal about this church? And he found some boxes and he opened one. Oh, he didn't open one. He, he grabbed one and he ran down the street. I think he might have grabbed two. I don't know one. It didn't matter. He, he ran down the street into an alley and he opened it to see what was in it. And it was sunglasses. And he was very disappointed. He, he puts a, a pair of sunglasses in his pocket. And and threw the, the the rest of the box on the on the trash uh, can because it, the it seemed it had just sunglasses. Then he walks into the main street and he puts his pair of sunglasses on. Now he's seeing a completely different world. He's looking at advertisements uh, for Coca Cola or whatever, and he's seeing uh, instead of that he's seeing no independent thought, consume, sleep, stay asleep, obey. And then he goes to a newsstand and um, he, he's looking through the equivalent of Newsweek or Time. And when he looks at it with his eyes, it's what we see. When he looks at it with the sunglasses, he's seeing the same things all the way through. The subliminal symbolically he couldn't see. Obey, no independent thought, don't think for yourself. And then a man comes to the newsstand to buy a paper and he, he looks at him through the glasses and suddenly he's looking at someone's not human. Uh, and He's uh, walking down the street. He goes into a store or whatever, and he's seeing through the glasses that some people, most people are human, but some people aren't. He looks at the television. He, he, the president's giving a speech. He looks through the glasses. The president's uh, no longer human. And the story um, uh, ends when uh, they realize, he and a, a friend helping him, that 
there's a signal being broadcast in, in the movie from the top of the TV tower from a, a, a broadcast dish. And it is stopping humans seeing what he can see through those glasses. And they, they smash the, 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 the dish, they destroy the dish, stop it broadcasting its signal. And immediately there's people sitting in bars and suddenly they look up to the guy next to them and know he's no longer human. The people reading the news are no longer human. The, the president's no longer human. Everyone can see it because this signal has been destroyed. And uh, this, this, I mean, I've said some apparently bizarre things over the years um, as I've gone down this rabbit hole. And one of the, the big things that, that, that I, I say in this book, and I, I back it up with, with as much evidence as possible, um, I say that this reptilian race is not on the moon, it's in the moon. I say this, this moon, the moon is not real as we perceive it to be real. And I'm saying that um, it's broadcasting a vibrational signal to this earth, which we are picking up um, through, uh, again, as the ancients uh, talked about, all over the world, um, the genetic manipulation of humanity by the gods, or the Anunnaki, as they were called in uh, ancient Sumer. They have different names all over the world. They're called the, uh, the Nagas in the Indian uh, Asia part of the world. Uh, they're called uh, the Chittahuri in, the, in, in South Africa. They're, they're different names, but they're talking about the same uh, controlling race. I'm saying that they're broadcasting a signal uh, from the moon uh, 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 within a certain frequency range and that human genetic manipulation was specifically designed eons ago to pick up this signal. And they do it through what we call the reptilian brain, uh, a, a fundamentally important uh, part of, of triggering human behavior. It's where we get fight or flight from. It's where... Um, we get our um, uh, fear and, and uh, our uh, survival responses from that keep us in constant state of anxiety if we let the reptilian brain dominate us. Um, and it's funny, you know, that uh, over these this 20 years, I've had um, a series of patterns in my life which have become very, very clear. And um, one of them is that I will get an overwhelming kind of, energy, whatever you want to call it, consciousness will envelop me and I'll get this insight into something out of nowhere. And from that moment, suddenly what I call five sense information, you know, names, dates, places, scientific background will start coming towards me relating to that initial, whoa, wh 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 where's this come from? S and, and confirming it with, with names, dates, places, scientific kind of background fact. And what happened when I was uh, writing this book is I sat in this very chair one day and this overwhelming feeling came to me that uh, the, uh, the moon is not real. It's a hollowed out planetoid by uh, a very, very advanced technological race, though not spiritual in any way or they won't be doing what they're doing. And um, that uh, inside the moon is where it's all coming from now. When that came to me, I thought, well, crikey, what's happened here? Where does this come from? So I, I went on the Internet and I just typed in a few keywords relating to that, expecting to get absolutely nothing. And what I got was a book called Who Built the Moon, which I'd not heard of before by two researchers. It was out, came out a few years ago and about the incredible anomalies surrounding the moon, uh, its position. Uh, it's positioned so that, for instance, from the Earth, it looks the same size as the sun. Therefore, that's why we have the eclipses. But there are incredible anomalies, which I list in detail in the book, and phenomenally um, ma massive un 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 answered questions about the moon. Because it's funny, we come into this reality, and the way things are is the way we uh, think they um, must be. And we don't ask kind of questions about things that are kind of so familiar to us. And when you, 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 you look in the sky, you see the moon. It's there every night, except in the, the, the few dark days of, of the month. And you, it's just the moon, isn't it? But when you start asking questions about it and looking into it with an open mind, you say, you, you see that, hold on a minute. There's a lot about this moon that is very, very strange indeed. 
In fact, the um, the authors of, of um, Who Built the Moon uh, encapsulate it when they say this, the moon is bigger than it should be, apparently older than it should be, much lighter in mass than it should be. It occupies an unlikely orbit and is so extraordinary that all existing explanations for its presence are fraught with difficulties and none of them could be considered remotely watertight. Again, we hear scientific theories about something and then it suddenly becomes scientific fact just by repetition, not by supporting evidence, but by repetition. And so when, when you say to a, a scientist uh, or, uh, in mainstream, how, how was the moon created? They say, oh, well, um, a, a planet about the size of Mars hit the Earth, a big chunk broke off and became the moon. And, and it's like, OK, where's the supporting evidence for that? When you delve into it, you found there, there, there are none. Um, the uh, theory is called the whack theory, that this Mars type planet hit the Earth and, and a chunk broke off and became the moon. But when the physics of that didn't work out, they came up with a double whack theory and um, to try to make it fit. Um, and that is that this Mars type planet hit the Earth and then came back and it, it again. You know, I'll give you one. I'm going to come back and give you another. I mean, it, it just <laughs> makes no sense whatsoever. And the more I delved into it, the more the more I thought, whoa, the moon is the key here. There was a, a Russian professor of biochemistry called uh, Isaac Asmanov, who um, did a lot of research into the moon. And he, and he said this. We cannot help but come to the conclusion that the moon by rights ought not to be there. The fact that it is, is one of those strokes of luck almost too good to accept. Small planets such as Earth with weak gravitational fields might well lack satellites. In general, then, when a planet does have satellites, those satellites are much smaller than the planet itself. Therefore, even if the Earth has a satellite, there's every reason to suspect that at best it would be a tiny world, perhaps 30 miles in diameter. But that is not so. Earth not only has a satellite, it is a giant satellite, 2,160 miles in diameter. How is it then that tiny Earth has one? Amazing. And that's that's what I've been pursuing uh, for a, a major part of the book. Um, Erwin Shapiro from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics said once, the best explanation for the moon is observational error. The moon doesn't exist because it shouldn't by all um, scientific uh, knowledge in terms of, of, of planets and moons. And um, when uh, you go uh, again deeper into this, I, I found that two Russian uh, scientists in the 70s, members of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, wrote a, a long article in, in the 1970s for a, a magazine called Sputnik magazine in which they said the moon is a hollowed out planetoid. Uh, by a, a, a very advanced race. Interestingly, what uh, NASA has, uh, one that scientist has said, what NASA has found is that the, the metals, uh, and, and if you like, the, um, the surface of the moon is made up of stuff that really should be inside the moon. And what these scientists were saying is that it, uh, because it was hollowed out by this advanced race before it was brought to the earth, um, a lot of the stuff that is in, was inside to start with is now on the outside. Um, and he, they explain um, why the moon is as it is, because it's actually a gigantic, if you like, spacecraft. And when you, you listen to how they explain um, what they do about why the moon is as it is and, 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 and the benefits of that for an inter, inter you know, uh, a cosmic spacecraft, all the anomalies of the moon before suddenly fall into place. Oh, I can see why that happens now. I can see why this is, they, they do this now. It all falls into place. And um, it's, uh, again, another area of this is that when the moon has been hit with, with massive blows, some of them from um, caused by NASA and some caused uh, by natural phenomenon, um, it has in, in the... Uh, term of uh, or, or the uh, phrase of nasa scientists the moon rang like a bell or you know rang like a gong because it's hollow what one scientist said it, 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 it's this is incredible he called it frightening i don't see it as frightening that that, that, that it, it could well be that the moon is hollow um and uh the uh, next stage of, of what i did after this was i called my friend credo mutwa who's this 
library of knowledge in South Africa, this Zulu shaman, um, who I've known for a long time. He's, he's an incredible man. Um, and he's the official historian of the Zulu nation, and he's uh, in his 80s now, and my goodness me, what he doesn't know about Zulu legend ain't worth knowing. And one of the things I've found over the years is that the Zulu legends, although they mirror similar legends uh, for similar phenomena around the world, they have proved to me over the years to be incredibly accurate in the way they symbolize um, things like scientific things and uh, historical things. And I said to him, not, hey, Credo, I've got all these ideas about the moon. I found this stuff about the moon. You know, what do you think? I said to him simply, can you tell me any Zulu legends relating to the moon? Oh, yes, he said. And off he goes, as he does, because he's an amazing man. And he said that the legends of the moon, the Zulu legends of the moon, was that it was brought to the earth hundreds of generations ago by two brothers called Wawani and Umpanku who were leaders of this reptilian race, what the South African Zulus called the, the Chittahuri. These were known as the Water Brothers in Zulu legend, and, quote, they had scaly skin like a fish. Now, if you look at the Sumerian and Mesopotamian accounts about the Anunnaki, they talk about two brothers called Enlil and Enki, and Enki was given another name, which actually meant water. He was known as the water god, Enki. So, again, different names but same theme, same story. Um, and what uh, Credo said is the legends uh, say that Wawani and Umpanku stole the moon in the form of an egg from the great fire dragon and emptied out the yolk until it was hollow. This is why they symbolize it as an egg, because they're symbolizing the fact that it was hollowed out. They then, quote in the Zulu legends, rolled the moon across the sky to the earth. And when it arrived, it caused cataclysmic events because of its effect on the earth and the way it affected the spin of the earth and the, 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 um, uh, the angle of, of spin and all the rest of it. And these are the catastrophes that the ancients, again, all over the world record, where they talk about the day the earth turned over and, and the great geological uh, um, volcanic and, and uh, earthquake phenomena that, that, that basically destroyed the civilization that the earth had been before. And um, when it settled down, this uh, uh, predator race then began to um, impose their will upon it and put in these uh, hybrid bloodline families that have been running the show on their behalf um, in the public arena while they've operated in the background. So you can see is a, there's a lot to get through in this book and there's um, a lot of uh, new ways of looking at the situation we're facing. Absolutely. I mean, the ancient knowledge, it's suppressed for a reason. They don't want us to know about it. But, I mean, you can even look at the star charts from uh, from the Sumerian era, and it'll show you Pluto and, and the whole solar system mapped out. And then we are so arrogant. We say, oh, we just discovered Pluto in 1930. No, 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 right. no, no, no. It's been there for thousands of years. Let me ask you this, though. We recently had Dr. Brooks Agnew on the show, and um, he has a theory that the Earth is hollow. Um, does this relate to that at all? Well, that may well be the, 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 the case. Um, I, I think that, uh, again, when you look at anything from the scientific perspective, you have to just keep an open mind on it because over and over and over again, what we're told is scientific fact is scientific theory. And uh, they say that the earth is, is, is made up in a certain way and goes down to this, this core and all the rest of it. But, you know, science knows so, so little about the nature of reality. Um, it cannot uh, be seen as the arbiter of truth. It cannot because um, science has uh, taken a certain view of what reality is and it uh, makes its assumptions of what planets are like, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from those um, uh, that foundation belief in how what what how reality is. But what I'm found, finding, um, even though I was uh, dubbed a crazy man and, and a nutter and you know all this stuff years ago, I'm finding now that more and more mainstream scientists are reading my books. More and more are coming to my events because. What's happened with science is they've reached a point where 
there are cul-de-sacs all over their theories. If their basic assumption of reality is true, they've got nowhere to go because there's so many phenomena they cannot explain from their core foundation belief in what reality is. Once you move that sense of reality from everything is solid and, it, and all the rest of it to and, and, and matter is this or matter is that to the fact that we are living in an equivalent of the world symbolized by the Matrix movies. The, the base foundation of this virtual reality universe, because that's what it is, um, is a vibrational information construct. This is how the changing vibrations from the black holes affect fundamentally the experience we're having because they change this vibrational information construct. And we, um, with our five senses, uh, we transform the vibrational information, that's what the five senses do, into electrical information which is passed to the brain and then it constructs that as a holographic reality which is like all holograms illusory in terms of its physicality um, you know I'm banging this table now um, but if you go into quantum physics and you look at the inside of an atom and the subatomic world there's no solidity whatsoever in an atom so how could it make up a solid world? It can't. Uh, but it's n n neither is an atom's not solid, but it makes up a solid world. Neither is that a contradiction when you understand how reality works, because we are decoding vibrational information um, into through this system process into holographic information, which only exists in our head. There is no out here. There is only an in here. And so the next question is, OK, if we're creating our reality in our head, how come we all see the same basic reality? If I looked out of my window now, I'd see the same cars that you would see if you looked out of this window, the same streets, the same houses, etc. Again, this is simply explainable. What we're living in is the equivalent, the, the dramatically uh, more advanced equivalent of the wireless internet. If I take my laptop out into the, the, the square outside my house, no wires, no electricity, no connections to anything, I can tune it if there's wireless internet out there. Um, I can tune it to the internet and on that computer screen, I can bring up the World Wide Web, which is a global collective reality. If you go on that web in uh, um, Australia or South Africa or, or America or, or Canada or England or wherever, you are going to pick up the same collective reality on that screen. And what the computer is doing is picking up information that the eyes cannot see because it's, it's outside of our tiny frequency range that, that our eyes can decode into holographic reality, therefore see it. And... Um, there's one exception to that, and oh, there may be a few, but there's one famous exception to that, and that is China, where the government have firewalled off great chunks of the Internet uh, through their computer system, so Chinese people cannot access great chunks of what the rest of the world can. I would suggest that that's what the reptilians have done. Um, and what, what the, these transmissions from the moon have done, they have created what I call in the book the moon matrix. It's We have the virtual reality universe, which is the information coming from the sun, which we're decoding as this time loop cycle goes, goes through its, um, its, its process. But these transmissions from the moon, I am saying in the book, have firewalled off the range of that information that we can actually access. And so we are in a much smaller range of perception, even visual uh, sight of this virtual reality universe than we should have been or should be and were once before this intervention. And again, we come back to that movie, They Live. They could not see these 
non-human entities, they couldn't see all these subliminal messages all around them because of that broadcast signal from that dish on top of that television tower. And I'm saying that that television tower dish in our reality is the moon and what's coming from it. But to, 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 to um, put us in the moon matrix, they have to hold us in the frequency range that that signal that vibrational information firewall is broadcasting on and so they've done two things they first of all or three things if you if you take them together one they have manipulated human genetics particularly the what we call the reptilian brain to become if you like a, a receiver transmitter like a microchip um, picking up the moon matrix transmissions they have then structured society to so affect us mentally and emotionally, not least keeping us in various states of fear and anxiety and, and, and guilt and worry and, oh, my goodness, to, ho to keep our, our, our frequency within the frequency of this, what I call, moon matrix. And so what's happening as we go through this transformation, this vibrational transformation through this changing vibration coming out of the black holes is we are being um, supported and encouraged and pushed to go beyond that frequency range and when we do when we what we call awaken um, we start to go beyond the confines of the moon matrix that vibrational prison if you like and we start to see and perceive things that we couldn't perceive before. We start to see th what's going on in the world as opposed to what we thought was going on. We start to see who we really are as opposed to what we believed we are all the way through our lives to this point. And, and, and what um, it seems to me is that as um, we disconnect, as we awaken, and uh, as we awaken and expand our, our awareness, so our vibrational state changes, and we're no longer held in that prison state, the moon matrix, we start to expand out of it. And, and what this whole deal is with microchips and uh, food and drink additives, the electromagnetic pollution, and I would strongly suggest what's coming from this harp system, it's designed to hold us more powerfully in that frequency range that holds us in collective ignorance, in the collective uh, uh, mind, if you like, of this moon matrix. But it can't stop us. It can't because it's a done deal. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, we are speaking with David Icke. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. This is Truth Frequency with Chris and Cherie on polygraphradio.com. When I was in the ayahuasca state, the opening line of this female voice was, the only thing you really need to know is infinite love is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. I looked down at my arm and I realized that I could no longer define the boundaries of my body. Because the left brain's shutting down, it's not decoding reality in the way it normally does, and so other levels of reality are able to be perceived because the decoding process is not affecting them. Land of Mountain. Infinite love is the only truth. Land of Dakini. Everything else is illusion. Land of Mountain. Of Mountain. And when I was in the ayahuasca state, I looked down at my arm and I realized that I could no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin and where I end. 
because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And when I was in that ayahuasca state, and all I could detect was this energy, energy. And I'm asking myself, what's wrong with me? What's going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter, went totally silent. Just like someone uh, took a remote control and pushed the uh, mute button. When I was in that ayahuasca state, first I was shocked. Land of mountain. But then I was immediately captivated by the magnificence of energy around me. Land of mountain. And because I could no longer identify the boundaries of my body, I felt enormous and expansive. I felt at one with all the energy that was, and it was beautiful there. Imagine what it would be like to be totally disconnected from your brain chatter that connects you with the external world. So here I am in this space, and any stress that related to me, to my job, it was gone. And I felt lighter in my body. And imagine all of the relationships in the external world and the many stresses related to any of those, they were gone. A, a, a sense of peacefulness. See, all this stuff, all this stress, all this stuff that, 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 that causes such grief, and, 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 and stops us from finding joy. It's all body computer stuff, not consciousness. When the colonial powers came into Africa, as everywhere else, they targeted the shaman and the carriers of the ancient knowledge and the ancient history. And in his words, they milked the minds of the shaman and then killed them. So to keep the knowledge uh, alive, the shaman streams started to create their own secret societies with horrendous initiation uh, rituals to make sure you really wanted the knowledge. Um, and they carried it underground so it would survive. Because what the colonial powers wanted, in other words, these bloodlines behind the colonial powers, they wanted to destroy as much of the ancient knowledge as possible because then they could impose their own version of history which would write out what they didn't want people to know. And welcome back to Truth Frequency. This is Chris and Cherie, and we are speaking with David Icke. And anybody who listens to this broadcast regularly knows that we play clips like that on a regular basis. And so you're very familiar with, with, with what we are talking about. Um, David, we had Dr. Rick Strassman on the show. He's the author of DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And yep. later on, we found out that his research was actually funded by the Scottish Rite. Now, we brought up the pineal gland to him, and he veered off the subject very quickly. Do you think that they were researching the pineal gland through Dr. Strassman and they do realize that this is the key right here? Um, we talk a lot about that on the broadcast. Get off of the fluoride, get off of the toothpaste and um, try to expand the consciousness. And if you can make it down to South America, try an ayahuasca experience because I believe that once people try that ayahuasca experience, uh, then they can really understand what it's like to, just like you said in that clip, disconnect yourself from that brain chatter. Yeah, well, you know, the the the, the Freemasons and, and these secret societies uh, are broken up, as we know, into levels of degree, and those levels of degree equal levels of knowledge. So there's the vast majority of, of, of lower level Freemasons, which are the vast majority of Freemasons. They they haven't got a clue of the bigger picture. Um, there'll be some who have who are coming through those bottom levels of degree, um, knowing where they're going. But but that 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 will be the the, the rarity, not not the um, the rule. 
But within the Freemasons, there are the inner cores who do understand how reality works. They do understand that if you um, suppress the Earth's energy field by, uh, for instance, doing rituals or putting nuclear power stations or, or uh, freeway interchanges on specific vortex points uh, in the Earth's energy grid, then you're going to suppress that energy and, and therefore suppress the level of awareness that um, humanity in general has um, access to. Uh, so uh, they will know that inner core will know about the pineal gland. And uh, as, as we can see, when you look at the effect of these uh, pollutants on the pineal gland, they're targeting it. Absolutely, they are, because they want to hold us in five sense reality. Look at society. That's what it's structured to to keep us in um, and, and stop us accessing those uh, greater levels of awareness, because in those greater levels of awareness is is the awareness that 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 of the situation we're in and that we have this predator. You know, when I um, was uh, writing the book and putting it together and I came across all this whole moon matrix thing that I've just explained, I, I then um, read a uh, a quote that I'd never read before, um, strangely, but I never had, from um, one of the Carlos Castaneda books. Uh, of course, he wrote them in the 60s around that time, um, and he was quoting a a Central American shaman source called Don Juan Matos. Now, some people say he didn't exist, but it, it really doesn't matter from the point of view of these quotes because uh, they're absolutely magnificent. And this is this is what the quote said. And uh, just to, you know, again, take into account, I've just come across this this Moon Matrix uh, situation, and and I've been putting it together in the book. Don Juan Matos is quoted as saying. We have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. Indeed, we are held prisoner. They took us over because we are food to them, and they squeeze us mercilessly because uh, we are their sustenance. They feed off our energy. I've gone into that in the books in the past a lot. Just at lower vibrational energy based on fear. Just as we uh, rear chickens in coops, the predators rear us in human coops, human eros. Therefore, their food is always available to them. Think for a moment and tell me how you would explain the contradictions between the intelligence of man, the engineer, and the stupidity of his systems of belief or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of belief, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetedness, greed and cowardice. It is the predator who makes us complacent, routinary and egomanical. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators engage themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist, a horrendous maneuver from the point of view of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. And what that does is fit perfectly into what I'm saying in the book about the moon matrix. The moon matrix is the collective mind of humanity. Uh, it's the herd mind. That's what they're feeding us 24-7. And it's only when we break out by expanding our consciousness, by opening our minds, we break out of that frequency range on which this moon matrix is broadcasting, that we break out of the herd. That's what's happening when people break out of the herd mentality and start to express their uniqueness and start to see the world and themselves in, in a much more expanded way. They've broken out of the moon matrix. And that's what we're in the process of doing now, collectively. Amazing. Amazing. Sheree? Well, I was just going to say, this is making so much sense for me, because I've, I've felt for a long time that humanity is not as it should be. Humanity was not made to to live out its life in a, in a little box. And, and you know, uh, we had... Chris Cowan on a few weeks ago and he said you know you get up in the morning you get in your little box you go to your little box to work and then you get 
you know, back in your little box. You go home to your little box and you just spend your life in a little box. And humanity is not supposed to be cowardly and it's not supposed to be mean to each other or hateful or, or harmful to each other or to the, the spirit of, of nature. It's supposed to be helpful to each other and helpful to, to, to the earth. And so this is making a lot of sense for me that we were hijacked. We've been hijacked and, uh, it's, it's a hijacking through the mind and it, it, it's, um, Interesting that you you talk there about the box. Well, another something else that's a box usually is a prison, um, and we are in a mind prison. The moon matrix is a mind prison. That's what it is. And um, when you, like I say, break out of it, you, you're breaking out of jail because you're starting to uh, access your true self as opposed to this firewalled self that we've been living um, all this time. And, of course, it's, it's feeding us this collective reality to such an extent that when you break out of it, people within the moon matrix still call you crazy or extreme or, 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 or you know, mad. Um, and scientists are caught in the moon matrix. They are uh, trying to perceive reality while being in the moon matrix. They're never going to suss it. The moon matrix is broadcasting um, information to stop scientists and all of us getting it, the situation we're in. And so a, a scientist will look at someone who's broken out of the moon matrix and is coming from a totally different uh, point of view in terms of reality, and he'll say, you're, crack, you're a crackpot, you're crazy. That's impossible. He's, no, it's just impossible for you to perceive it. It's not impossible that it's actually happening. So uh, this moon matrix is the key and breaking out of it. And um, one of the areas is don't get caught in the reaction system of the reptilian brain. The reptilian brain is the key because that's the if you look at the uh, body computer from from uh, another perspective of what it really is, that that reptilian brain um, survival reaction system is, is a microchip. A receiver transmitter microchip and it's picking up the moon matrix. And, and if, and I, what I've done in the book is I've gone into society and looked at it from the perspective of the reptilian brain, the, um, uh, character traits of the reptilian brain, what we, uh, what we get from it, how we react to things instead of thinking things through, um, how we react with fear and panic instead of thinking things through, um, and, and calmly looking at a situation. And when you look at the character traits of the reptilian brain, this is from mainstream science, these character traits, not, you know, from a darkened room. And then you look at society. We live in a society that is simply a collective expression of the reptilian brain. It's all it is. And, and in the, uh, the clips, um, during the break there where you were, I was talking about the, the left brain, right brain. This is also fundamental to what the moon matrix is doing. Through the right brain, we can access the great beyond. That's why when um, you go into right brain reality, you perceive everything as one instead of a partners. The left brain takes information and it uh, in the realm of no time and it forms it into a sequence. And that sequence is what we call time because we perceive time by the sequence of events unfolding in our reality. And we say, cool, dear, is that the time time's flown? Our perception is that the sequence of events we've just experienced have happened really quickly. Or we can sit in a dentist waiting room or somewhere or watching Fox News and time can seem to pass very, very slowly <laughs> indeed, um, especially watching Bill O'Reilly uh, and and. It's just the way the left brain is sequencing events into an apparent um, past to present to future. And the left brain uh, perceives everything in terms of structure. And so most people are living their lives through the reptilian brain and through the left brain. And it's when you open up to the right brain that you start to... Um, enter realms of what we call genius. They're not genius at all. They're just our natural state being reaccessed after being um, firewalled off from it for so long. It's uh, it's interesting, you know, when you 
you see these people like um, we've got a, 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 a man in, in England called Stephen Wiltshire, and he is what they call an autistic savant. Everyone's got to be given a label. And basically what that's done is, um, although it's perceived to be a problem, it's opened him up to right brain reality and therefore to the infinite possibility and genius of the more expanded consciousness and a lot of these autistic savants struggle to uh, interact with mainstream society if you like for a simple reason they're not coming through the left brain that interacts with left brain with left brain mainstream society and this Stephen Wiltshire was taken up in a helicopter by the BBC um, and flown over London for half an hour. He then uh, came back down and drew London from the air from memory. It's incredible. If you go to Stephen Wiltshire's website, um, you'll be able to see some of his work. It's incredible. He's 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 produced. Uh, he's done the same in Rome and other places. He's he's put the buildings in the right places. He's put the right number of um, uh, windows in the buildings, even though he uh, apparently he can't actually uh, account or couldn't at the time anyway, uh, because he's accessing this this genius that we all are, that we've been firewalled off from. And if you look at society uh, and, and, and the, the, the structure of the institutions of society, how do you progress in them? By being a prisoner of the left brain. They don't want right brain people. You go to school um, from an earliest age. They're trying to get you um, to school with uh, academic uh, subjects as early as possible. In fact, they're trying it earlier and earlier now because what they want to do, they want to get children locked into the left brain as early as possible. The more time children have to play uniqueness, imagination, right brain, creativity, the more the you, the, they're going to open their right brain from a very young age. They don't want that. So the, 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 the um, spending on art classes and, 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 and the, the period they give young children to play before they start hitting them with academia is getting smaller and smaller because this is what they, they, they know they're doing. They want to lock people in the left brain from the earliest possible age. And um, once they, uh, they do that, um, they, they progress into the school system, uh, in the school system, because what the school system is saying is, here's some left brain information, hold it, remember it, and then regurgitate it out on an exam paper telling us what we've told you is reality. If you do it brilliantly, then you go to university, where what we'll do is do the same process at a higher level of information. And then if you do it brilliantly there, you'll get a first class degree or a degree. And then you, you'll choose your specialization. What do you want to do with your life? Do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be a scientist? Do you want to be a politician and all the rest of it? Particularly when you're talking about doctors and scientists, etc. You then go into your specialization and you go through your exams in your specialization and, and you go through the same process. And if you are a right brainer who looks at it and says, hey, there's other explanations for this, not just the one you're giving, giving me. Suddenly you're a disruptive influence. They don't want those people. There's another guy, um, uh, one of these autistic savants who learned Icelandic, which is an extraordinarily difficult language to learn in a week. And his, um, language teacher, Icelandic uh, language teacher, said he's not human. Yes, he is human. <laughs> he's the humans we should be. But he's not the human, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of that, that we have been manipulated to be through this process of the predator coming in and taking over our minds and, and the collective mind. So when you look at this, where we're going where young people today and, and, and our children and grandchildren today are going as this vibrational change brings down to this moon matrix, and it is, it will, because we're not working alone. There are major, massive energetic forces and forces of consciousness at work behind this. Um, they're going into that world where their true potential is going to be um, accessed, where the days of I can't, I could never, poor me, little me, are over. 
And we've just got to get through this period of transition where the control system in its death throes is going to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at humanity to try to hold us in the grip of control that it's held us in so far. Wasting your time, ladies and gentlemen, wasting your time. It's just a matter of playing this out, and, and the, we, we're going to live in a very, very different world. And now, you know, people say, what's, what's going to happen? Uh, you know, the control system's coming in, what can we do? Well, I can say that the control system's in its death throes, and we've got to turn from the sheep to the lion, get the courage going, and um, stand up for what we know is right instead of running away because we fear the consequences of doing what we know to be right. And we can access these truth vibrations and we can become expressions of them in human form. That's what people are doing more and more. And we can we can move this control system out uh, uh, quicker than uh, would normally happen. And we can then start to build the world of love, of, of truth, of infinite potential that is awaiting us the other side of this transformation and for some people is already happening and it's a wonderful time to be alive we've just got to disconnect the backside from the sofa disconnect the eyes from fox news and and all this conditioning of reality that goes on and start to live what we are infinite consciousness all that is has been and ever will be and this control system will not be able to cope with that because it's that ignorance that sense of little me that's actually holding the bricks together that's holding the, the control system together it can't survive human awakening uh humans awakening to our true uh, and infinite nature it can't and that's why it's doomed well madison avenue would like people to think that they are just little me and that they can't they're just they're bound to be mediocre they're bound to uh not produce anything special um that they're just like everybody else and that everybody's mediocre and that the reality is that we're all special we're all, we all have very unique traits about us and the controllers have completely cut us off from feeling that way um, yeah and, and those traits they don't we, 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 they're so uh disconnected because of the way this control system works we don't even realize or most people don't even realize they have them absolutely infinite love is the only truth everything else is illusion we quote that over and over and over again on this show um let me go to a question from the chat room they were talking about this earlier um people were asking what's the reason for nasa bombing the uh sending a satellite to the moon and then bombing it well i think that will um that will come out more with with the, the passage of um of, of of hindsight but uh, i mean just on one level what one of the things that that, that does i mean that, that see that there are things going on with the moon that we don't know about um you know for instance, when you're operating inside the moon, um, where are your resources? Where do you get your resources from to, to run the whole show? You don't get them from the moon, clearly. So where do you get them from? You get them from Earth. <laughs> Our resources are being, are being uh, uh, transported to the moon. Um, and uh, this is what a, a lot of the uh, economic uh, resource system is doing. You know, it's not, it's not being used for humanity. It's being shipped away. You know, when um, uh, the Anunnaki were uh, described in the Sumerian tablets, these clay tablets that, is, that, that talked about the arrival of the Anunnaki and how they, 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 they took over, um, they, they said that um, one of the things they wanted humanity to do was mine for gold. That's also um, what you find in the Zulu legends, the same theme, that the... Um, these reptilians, the Chittahuri, whatever you want to call them, the Anunnaki, wanted gold for, 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 for uh, their own reasons. And, you know, I don't think it's um, an accident uh, that they're now finding, I'm seeing more and more of these stories, that what we thought were massive, massive vaults of gold all over the world, actually most of it is either not there or is not gold at all, not, not right through to its core. I'm seeing more and more stories that a lot of, that these um, gold bars in these vaults that are passed around as gold are actually, I think it's tungsten, which, 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 which in, in, in weight and everything is very, very close to gold within a, a, a tiny few decimal points, apparently. 
and and they've they've coated these things with cold. But if you drill down, as some people have, it seems, like I say, I'm seeing more and more of these stories coming up. They the, the gold doesn't doesn't last very long when you when you start to drill into it. And I think that we're going to find because the lid's coming up. One, what I was told 20 years ago when I came across this phenomenon of the truth vibrations, one of the most fundamental expressions impacts of this vibrational change is it's going to bring to the surface all that's remained hidden it's going to bring to the surface what's been hidden within us as what we call individuals and it's it's going to bring to the surface all that's been hidden from humanity collectively now look at what's happened over the last 20 years the last 10 years the last five years the last two or three years in terms of what's been hidden from us coming to the surface it's happening. It's happening. What I was told 20 years ago was coming. It's happening. My own work is an expression of it. And people like me, this radio program is, is an expression of that um, hidden coming to the surface. So we are going to find out everything in the end. And we're going to find out that tremendous amounts of various Earth's resources are being shipped to the moon to, to run this um, this satellite control system, because from what I'm understanding more and more, this uh, moon planet um, takeover is actually not a one off for Earth. It's a modus operandi for these reptilian entities, this reptilian race or these expressions of that race. Anyway, there are these moons all over the place that do the same thing. First of all, they arrive. They have tremendous uh, uh physical effects on the target planet which which brings an end to the original uh, culture and society and then they take it over by by the process that i've been talking about um in this program and i don't think it's an accident at all that uh, one of the themes in star wars um produced by a big time insider george lucas was the death star um which has to all intents and purposes a very very uh uh, symbolic resemblance to the moon to say the least and inside the death star although it appeared to be a planet or a moon inside the death star was this whole bloody um uh, world of, uh, of 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 um different segments different uh, uh, technological possibilities like an, a society that was traversing um the cosmos causing and wreaking havoc and i would suggest that that wasn't symbolized in the star wars movies by uh accident and you know a lot of what, what they say in the star wars movies you know in, in a galaxy far far away uh, and all that stuff i would say what, what what that symbolizes is much closer to home and is not long ago or long in the future it's happening and it's been happening for a long time and and so we'll we'll understand um why they bombed the moon more clearly with the passage of events because i feel very 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 strongly that in the next couple of years or so, there are going to be things happening of various kinds that are going to start to focus people on the moon. And, and the questions about, hold on a second, what is this thing now? I look at it again. Um, there's going to be a lot of things uh, uh, relating to the moon that are going to turn attention to it. It's part of the, it's part of the truth vibrations. It's part of bringing the hidden to the surface. And uh, one of the things, of course, that bombing the moon and we found water has done is, is focused on the fact that it's some kind of natural phenomenon. Um, it's, it's not. It's, um, it's a construct, um, pro probably from a planetoid to start with, but it's a construct and uh, it's not what we think it is. And that's going to become clearer and clearer because the truth vibrations cannot be stopped. What we need to know, we are going to know. Oh, and what we know now we didn't know 20 years ago 10 years ago five years ago is just fantastic and and this process is going to go on and it's going to get more and more amazing as as the veil lifts um on on deeper and deeper levels of this whole um conspiracy that we we were talking about absolutely ladies and gentlemen we are speaking with david ike let's take one more quick break and, I, and then i think david has to go uh but we have a couple of questions from the chat room and guys i just want to apologize the phone lines are down so we can't take calls but uh if you want to send a couple of questions to yahoo i am we have it open truth frequency is the username and we will be right back
who controls the web? The spider controls the web. And the spider is, is, is at a level that you never see. It's not Tony Blair. He's a, he's a strand. The Bush family, they're a strand. Even the Rockefellers are a strand. The real power that's manipulating all this, you never see it, operates from the shadows. Um, and uh, so it's operating to a, 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 a central dictating policy. And this is why you're seeing um, the same things happen in all different countries at the same time. It's because the uh, orders and the policy are coming from a central point. We can work on the level of banking scams, political scams, manipulated wars, manipulated 9-11s. And we should, because we need to know that. But if that's all we're doing in terms of communicating knowledge, then basically we're operating in a cycle of this is the problem, but how the hell do we get out of this? We will never know how to set ourselves free until we understand the nature of who we bloody well are. How do you set yourself free when you don't even know who you are? How do you set yourself free when you don't even know the nature of reality that you're living in and manifesting and making happen without your knowledge that you're making it happen? You can't. So alongside the information about, um, you know, the five sense level of this conspiracy, if you like, we have to um, just as powerfully, I would say more powerfully, communicate the nature of reality and, and how, we, how we are creating our reality and how we are allowing it to be created for us by having ourselves programmed with certain beliefs, certain perceptions and all the rest of it all the time. Uh, the two must go together, otherwise, you know, we're never going to get out of this. All freedom is our natural and eternal right, not the gift of some dark suit or uniform to decide if it's going to give it to us or not. And welcome back to Truth Frequency with Chris and Cherie. And we are speaking with David Icke. Uh, DavidIcke.com is his official website. And his new book uh, is out, available over at DavidIcke.com. Um, let's go to a couple of uh, questions from the chat room. Uh, number one, I think you already went over this, David, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Uh, do you think Lucas has the right idea with the Force and uh, particularly its description? With the? Uh, with the Force from Star Wars. The Force, yeah. Well, I think that the, the themes of, um, of Star Wars uh, are coming not from in, entirely uh, imagination. I would say mostly not from imagination, but from... Um, a, a knowledge of, of what's going on in the background and um, he's symbolized it and played it out in, in the movies. So yeah, all, all of that, those themes I think are based on um, what is actually happening. Uh, there was what, there was one reptilian entity in it. And um, uh, in one of the series that the a red guy, very reptilian. Um, and uh, Crater Mutwa said to me that he was called to the television one day in South Africa when that movie was um, on the television. Uh, Credo, come on, come on, come on, look at this. And he said, I, I, I couldn't believe it. He said, because I am looking at uh, these Chittahuri in the way they are described um, by ancient and modern, modern experience. So uh, I think uh, Star Wars is very accurate. And I think there's a lot of themes in Star Trek as well that um, are very, very um, accurate. Um, they have... Um, one um, one story I saw in Star Trek, which was of a hollowed out asteroid that that was turned into a spacecraft. Um, and there are people, um, some of them in the past have been scientists, and I'm I'm certainly uh, one of them who look at uh, the asteroid type moon quote moon of uh, Mars called Phobos, and I have no doubt that that is a hollowed out. Um, uh, asteroid uh, stroke spacecraft um, which is connected in some way to those that are in the moon um, and um, so the themes in these so-called uh, fictional science fiction movies and stories are, are often based on what's actually happening and I think they are 
Um, let's go to one more. Uh, David talks about tribes around the world uh, having this story. Do the Aborigines in Australia link into any of that? Uh, they mention about the Rainbow Serpent. That's all the info that I got on that. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Well, it does make sense. You see, um, the uh, Aborigines in Australia are like the what well, the, the Zulus in uh, South Africa today that hold the knowledge they're like the hopis that hold the knowledge not all of all these people do um they are um like people in south america who hold the knowledge the uh, the knowledge that the ancients had was once widely known if you go back far enough um but as the suppression increased and increased it went into fewer and fewer hands. Um, and, uh, you know, like I've talked about on this, this program, um, I think in one of the clips, that the way that the, the, uh, the colonial powers came in, because the British Empire was a major, major expression of this moon matrix uh, reptilian hybrid uh, force. Um, and they killed the, the shaman having uh, milked their minds, as Credo Mutua described it. Uh, and these, these shaman um, and, and these knowledge streams were passing it through the generations, often verbally, uh, sometimes uh, written down. And these people were targeted to take that out of, um, of, of public knowledge so that they could impose this, this fake reality, this fake history uh, upon the world. And that's what they teach in the schools and the universities, the fake history, not what, what has um, uh, uh, actually happened. And uh, so... All these ancient peoples, whether they be the Aborigines or, or, or Zulus or anywhere around the world, they ha- have carried this knowledge through the generations. And it's as what we call Western society through the colonial powers that, that, that took over these countries um, uh, came in that they targeted these people. But still in the Aborigines of, of, of Australia and all over the world, that knowledge still exists if you go and look for it. And, and this is the, the, another thing. A lot of it is symbolic because we're at a point now where the technology that we are seeing, whether it's the Internet and other forms of technology, are mirroring the reality we're actually experiencing. Uh, they may be lower levels compared with the, the reality of the virtual reality universe, but we have tools like the Internet, or the wireless Internet, that we can use to express what we're trying to get across in the way of how the virtual reality universe works. If you go back to these ancient peoples, the, the, the ancient shaman and the, the seers and the carriers of the knowledge, they didn't have the Internet. And they didn't have these these technological analogies that we have today. So they had to try to explain reality and, and the predators and all the rest of it, uh, the control, in ways that people in that time could understand. So they used um, analogies that were familiar to the people uh, as they lived their lives. What the kind of anthropologists and the, the, the people like that have done uh, they've gone and looked at these ancient stories and these ancient uh, uh, legends, and they've taken them literally. And what they, they say, these are, primi- these are primitive people. Look what they're saying. It's analogy, man. And because they haven't got that, they haven't seen the profound nature of what they're reading or what they're hearing. It's like a, we've had a wonderful example of that in the program today with the Zulus symbolizing the moon or the Zulu shaman anyway, symbolizing the moon as an egg because it was hollowed out. Oh, the moon's an egg. That's a primitive people. This is where they've missed the boat and missed the point. And when you take the knowledge that we, ha- we have now and you, you, you play it across realizing the symbolic nature of much of these ancient legends and and accounts, then the two sync together magnificently. And like I say, you see just how profound um, some of these symbolic stories and legends are. Excellent. Um, That was a great answer. And as a matter of fact, he just sent me a private message and said, wow, David went into so much more than than, uh, he says thank you very much in the private message. Um, That's a pleasure. Thank you, mate. 
Let me ask you this. Uh, one more question. Well, we have a couple of more questions, if you don't mind. But uh, one question from somebody else in the chat room. He says, I've seen reptilian entities while on ayahuasca. Have you ever seen those? And are these the same reptilian entities that you speak of? Well, f- first of all, when I talk about reptilian entities, I, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily decrying all reptilian Well, in fact, not necessarily. I'm not. I'm not even beginning to decry all reptilian entities. Uh, genetics throughout this universe. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that this is a group that take a reptilian form that, that, that have a seriously unpleasant agenda for humanity. But interestingly, um, the reason I took the ayahuasca was I, I wrote a book called um, The World Trade Center Disaster, uh, Alice in Wonderland and the World Trade Center Disaster. And as I was writing it, I thought, you know, when I finish this, if I'm going to take this further, understanding what the heck's going on, I've got to get out of this reality, uh, not in a dream, but in, in, a, in a conscious state. And at that time, um, because the synchronicity of the way things happen is amazing if you flow with it, I got an invitation to go uh, and speak and participate in uh, an event in the Brazilian rainforest where they were going to take ayahuasca about four times in the 10 days or so. Um, and the reason they asked me, um, Chris, is because so many people on previous uh, events, because they have them two or three a year, had seen reptilian entities in their ayahuasca state. And you read accounts where of the, of, of the ancients where they talk about the fact that when they take various substances, they meet their gods, they meet the gods, because... These reptilian entities um, are invariably operating just outside of human sight. I don't think they used to once, but this moon matrix has has, has shut us down. We're not accessing the same frequency range of visual sight that we were before. Um, But they uh, talk about taking these substances and then interacting with their gods, which are operating on frequencies that they don't normally um, access, but through ayahuasca they can. And so um, I, I went uh, and, and took this stuff, and, and part of what I experienced was not reptilian entities, but very, at one point, very reptilian imagery. It was very much like the, the Chinese dragon, Far Eastern dragon kind of imagery that I was seeing for, for quite a time of that experience. Um, then I went somewhere else. Um, but these uh, reptilian entities um, can be seen if you go into other states of awareness. And ayahuasca and these other substances can take you there. But, you know, for me, when we talk about uh, psychoactive substances, I've only taken two doses of ayahuasca. I could have taken four on that event. I only took two. I didn't feel to two. I, I, I'd experienced what I needed to experience. And then I took some quite weak magic mushrooms on one other occasion to see what that was like. And that was it. I've never taken any since. I've never taken any before that. And I have no desire to because my 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 goal is to get there as, as we all can um, directly, but what these um, substances can do in a controlled situation, because they take they they can t- they take you where you are at a deeper subconscious level, and if you're in a real bad space at a deep uh, level, then my goodness, you, you will have a bad experience. And there were people at this event that had bad experiences, um, uh, but I, had, I, had, I, I for, for whatever reason, I had an incredible, uh, amazing, life-changing one. So it's 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 not that you take the stuff and oh, it's this is how it is. It's different for different people, and it, you know. And I met people who had probably um, smoked, drank, or sniffed most of the Brazilian rainforest at some point in their lives, <laughs> and and I have to say they were no more enlightened than some people who've never. I, I, I many people I know who've never taken anything. So it's it's it, it can also become a just one more and I'll find enlightenment. You, you, the only way you're going to find enlightenment is to realize you don't have to find it because you're already enlightened. What we need to do is remove the barriers that we throw up and we're encouraged to throw up between ourselves and our natural state, which what people call enlightenment. And uh, if you if you run around uh, constantly trying to find some middleman method of, of, of doing that, then you're never going to find it because we have to find it directly by removing the, the onion layers of programming and belief 
that hold us in the box instead of allowing us out to the infinite self that we really are. And, you know, in some ways, and I'm, I'm, it's coming to me as I'm talking here, we talk about middle men in religion, the men in frocks, the, 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 the priests, the vicars, the imams and all this stuff, um, who stand at that point. It basically only through me can you can you uh, experience God? You know, well, stand aside, mate. I'll do it directly. Thank you. But you know, even psychoactive drugs can be like the priest. They can become the middleman you're looking for. We can access those higher levels of awareness that that consciousness that I call the infinite um, directly without this. It's, it, it's good to have a quick experience and say, oh God, look look what's beyond what I can naturally experience in my conscious mind. But then, you know, to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it over and over again. Uh, you know, I met someone once who had um, uh, something like 600 LSD trips um, in the 60s and that stuff like that. He was a very, very nice guy, but he was no more enlightened than people who've never seen LSD or, or, or even heard of it. So, you know, we have to do it in the end, although I, these can be little, um, little tools to help us on the way. I believe that LSD was... Uh bastardization and i hate to use that term but um of the ancient knowledge of what the shamans have to offer and i for my research i found that tim leary he was actually a cia op and his whole goal was to make people think that they're having this global shift in consciousness and this this awakening and it was really just frying their brain well if the the more that i have um i've researched and come across information over the years chris the more that whole 60s um, flower power revolution was uh, not a revolution it was a total diversion um, and uh, the whole drugs thing and the free sex thing was all all part of the the diversion and you know there have been some people from that so-called revolution that have gone on and um, and stayed with their their, their principles but um, I've met so many people who were big time into that whole era who are now right straight off the bat standard issue lawyers and business people and stuff like that and that was just a phase they went through and um, when you transform there's no going back there isn't um, and and we can have the fake transformation where you think something's going on or some revolution's taking place and then it's like a default on the computer it just defaults back to to what it was like before that's not a transformation that's just a fad, and um, we 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 need to um, realize. I would suggest that this transformation we're going through now needs every fiber, every bit of our our, our uh, focus. Um, it has to become everything in our lives, uh, and not an add-on, because um, otherwise it's not a transformation. It's a fad, and it will it, it will pass by uh, the people that treat it like that. Um, and um, interestingly, I've mentioned this in the book. I don't know whether you've come across this, but um, I read a series of um, articles that are available on the Internet by a man who was, uh, it seems, you know, very much uh, went through the 60s revolution and thought it was great and, the, and the, the music. And I love the music, by the way. You know, I love the 60s music. In fact, I stopped evolving after Donovan musically, really. But um, <laughs> And he wrote these articles about... Um, the origins of that whole flower power um, era. And it's extraordinary. They're very, very good. If you put things like um, uh, the, the flower power revolution and, and, and words to the effect of conspiracy, uh, what, what have you. I, I mean, I've, I've got my book here at the moment, but I put the key words you put in in my book, which will get you these articles. Um, and it's interesting how many key people in the 60s revolution came from military or American intelligence families. Extraordinary. Do you know, one of the things he points out is that, um, it's just one example, he comes up with many, many, um, is Jim Morrison of the Doors. You know, his father was an, an ad admiral in the American Navy. Yes. And yes. You, know, you know when they had the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which um, led to the massive expansion into what became the fully-fledged Vietnam War, for people who haven't come across that, the Tonkin incident, uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident, was um, the official story was that a flotilla of um, American naval ships were attacked 
by Vietnamese shipping. And um, that led Lyndon Johnson to use that as an excuse to expand uh, the Vietnam War, which uh, he did as a result of Kennedy's assassination, who didn't want to do that, would seem. Anyway, um, it comes clear with the passage of time and research that no one attacked that flotilla at all. It was all made up. One of the uh, uh, pilots, American pilots above it, basically said um, in, in a book, and I, I quote, I quote in my, my, my new book, um, he flew across. Th- th- there was no firing from Vietnamese shipping at all. Well, it was just um, reported by the flotilla, I would say absolutely planned in advance, that we're under fire and all the rest of it. The Gulf of Tonkin incident. The admiral in charge of that flotilla was Jim Morrison's father. And what these um, uh, articles do is, is, is make you think um, very, very seriously about what the force was behind um, that whole 60s so-called revolution. And uh, it's very clear when you connect the dots from those articles and other sources of information over the years that it was this cabal, this control system that did it. Did it. it was a massive diversion and, of course, once the Vietnam War ended, bingo, so did the whole 60s revolution, because it was not a revolution. It was a fad. Mm-hmm. It was connected to a specific event. And what that did was dilute the, the, um, the other more grounded opposition to that war for many years. And, uh, you know, then you add, as you quite rightly say, you, you bring in the, the fact that the the drugs thing and Timothy Leary and the um, the LSD and all this stuff came from the same source. I mean, the CIA were the people behind uh, 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 the distribution and the uh, emergence of LSD. Um, and you put it all together, that, that was uh, very clearly a, a, a creation of the control system. And uh, we have to avoid all that stuff now. And out of, of course, the 60s revolution came what we call the New Age movement which I would say also is a massive diversion. I call the New Age movement um, the last cul-de-sac before the uh, gold mine because when you reject traditional religion and you reject um, traditional science and you talk about um, everything being one and uh, the, everything's a vi- vibrational field, etc., etc., you're getting dangerously bloody close to understanding the, the much greater picture that, that, that is, is now coming to light. They don't want that. They need another diversion. They need another exit from the freeway to understanding that's going to take people off into another cul-de-sac. And that, I would suggest, is what the New Age movement is. And it's an, it's a, a, it's a, an outgrowth of that 60s revolution, if you look at it. And a lot of these uh, Eastern gurus who were brought across to Europe and America to, to fuel that New Age movement uh, when it was at its peak. It's starting to die out now because people are getting more grounded and, and they're bringing the, the pieces together much more powerfully. That's why the, this, this period is, is so uh, powerful. But th- they were also brought, brought out here to um, the, the whole Beatles thing with the Maharishi and all this stuff was all fueling this whole New Age uh, movement. There were some very good things about it. I mean, like I say, understanding that everything is one, which is what the Eastern religions talk about anyway. Um, uh, the, the fact that everything's a vibration, everything's a different vibration, all these things are very good. But it's, it's, it's also di- diverted into uh, nonsense, um, which stops people expanding out into the, into the greater understanding. Uh, and, and that is that you don't need middle people. I don't care if they're Catholic bishops, whether they're uh, Islamic priests. I don't care if they're Ashtar Command or the Great White Bloody Brotherhood uh, in New Age belief. We don't need middle people. We are infinite consciousness. We do not need a conduit to get to what we already are. We need to remember who we are and remove the barriers of belief and programming that stop us experiencing and expressing the true genius and infinity of potential that we really are. That's what we need to do. We don't need middlemen and middlewomen in any shape or form, including Eastern gurus, by the way.
extremely powerful words, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Cherie, can you go to a couple of the questions on the IM? Yeah, sure. Um, Louisa said, "Hi, David. What do you think the best way of What do you think the best way of shielding yourself from this negative reptilian, fearful thinking, controlling influence is?" Well, it operates on a certain frequency, so it's not to be on that frequency. I, I have gone into this in detail in the book um, because it's not just about what how things are; it's how things can be different. Um, the the reptilian brain is our connection to this moon matrix. It's feeding us this anxiety, fear, uh, worry, all this stuff that that humans feel constantly, and. Uh, it's also a reaction system. If you go into the, the way the reptilian brain uh, operates, it doesn't think, it reacts. You know when you, you, you're faced with a situation and you react, and then about five minutes later, maybe longer, you go, oh, my God, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. Oh, I was over, well, I was over the top when I, oh, what was I doing? Well, what's, what's, what's going, oh, what was I doing, is the neocortex part of the brain which thinks things through um but the reptilian brain doesn't think it just reacts it's it, 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 in light in, in connection to uh, another part of the brain called the amygdala it's constantly scanning the environment looking for threats uh to its security threats to its survival and it's not just survival physically it's survival of reputation so when someone's challenging you um, in terms of your reputation or what you're saying or something like that, then the reptilian brain can kick in and go over the top in your response because the reptilian brain is seeing a, a threat to survival of reputation. Um, and again, the reptilian brain kicks in if your belief system is in danger of not surviving in, 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 in the face of what someone's saying to you. This is why people are going, stop, stop, don't want to hear it. Don't want to, I don't, change the subject. I don't want to hear it. Because information that people uh, are in, in danger of hearing will undermine the belief system, the reptilian brain kicks in. Defensive, um, survival of belief system. Stop it. Shut up. Don't want to hear it. So in all these different areas of life, not just survival physically, the reptilian brain is, is, is reacting to preserve different versions of our status quo. So if we stop reacting, um, don't count to 10, count to 50. And then have a think about it. And by that time, the reptilian brain's reaction system will have been will have been bypassed. And you can start looking at a situation you're facing with um, uh, in, in a calmness, you know, because the reptilian brain has uh, reacted before calm consideration can even begin to be calmly considered. And we need to break that system, that reaction system. There are some things about the reptilian brain uh, uh, that are good. When you're driving down the road and someone steps in front of your car, it's the reptilian brain that gets the anchors on, gets the brakes on before you've even thought to react. So in that way, it's good. But when it's starting to dictate our entire reality and the way we react to information, to react to, to situation, social situations, uh, whatever, then then that's when we really need to disconnect from it, because um, in doing so, we'll be disconnecting from the collective mind, the the moon matrix mind that is being fed to us. Um, let's see. Sheree, do you want to go to the next I am question? Yeah, sure. Um, this is uh, from Devil Unlimited. He said, I'm a political science major and I'm committed to changing the current political system for a world of politics free or a minimized governmental system. And I know that speaking truth would put me in, a, in danger and I accept that. For my voice to be heard, however, I need to go through a certain process. How do you think I should behave for me not to be killed in that process of finally being able to speak to a large crowd? Well, um, <laughs> we should have read that before we read it online. <laughs> no, it, no, no, that's that's a very, very good point uh, that um, is being made here. Um, this is the last one I can take, by the way, because I've got to go. Okay, okay. But, um, but um, it's a very good place uh, to finish. First of all, um, our reality, our prime reality, is not what we think we're experiencing in the holographic play-out world in the you know in what we call the human brain as it decodes vibrational information into electrical information into digital information that's why mathematics is so much a part of this universe uh into um 
holographic information, which is our daily experience, like me looking at this computer screen and this, this pile of books here. Now, the prime level is of the information construct is the vibrational waveform level. And we connect with that at what we call the, with what we call the subconscious mind. This is why the subconscious is so uh, powerful in human experience, because it's, it's connecting us into the prime level of this reality, which is uh, the information construct of the what I call the metaphysical universe. A friend of mine in South Africa uses that term, uh, metaphysical universe. It's very, very, very good. That's what I call now the information construct of the vibrational level, the metaphysical universe. Now, that is where things are happening. That is where things are decided. And what we do is through our body computer is that we um, decode that information through into the holographic experience. Put in a simple uh, uh, way, the metaphysical universe is the projector at the back of the movie theater and the holographic world is the movie hitting the screen that we all watch. By the time it's hit the screen, it's a done deal. Where we can change it is in the metaphysical universe um, by changing the, the movie, by changing the film, the reel. Now, if at, in your uh, deeper levels you accept that you can be killed for your belief, that you can be taken out for what you say, then you are creating that possibility in your metaphysical universe, and therefore you can um, decode that through to the holographic world and someone goes bang, bang, good night. If at that deep level where this reality and experience is constructed, you do not allow that possibility into your uh, sense of reality, then they can get as many guns as they want. They can get nuclear missiles, if you like. They'll never take you out. Because if they can you see, we are creating our reality in our heads holographically, if you like, when we decode it. And we are decoding, like the wireless Internet, a collective reality. But that's where it ends. You know, we can all look out of the window and see a blue car going past passed on the road and that's that's the um the base uh, uh, foundation of the the construct if you like but not all of us will agree that we what we think of the blue car not all of us would 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 like it not all of us would not like it not all of us would see the blue car in the same way it's a ford isn't it no 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 it's a chevy or something so we have this base reality that we experience as the world, but we are interacting with it in our own unique way. And if we interact with it from the basis of I speak out and speak my truth, I, I can be taken out, then we create that possibility. Not mean it will happen, but we create the possibility. If we erase that, we cannot, I cannot be removed for what I believe, and I will not be stopped from pursuing and communicating what I believe. There'll be challenges and there'll be things that, where you'll have to change direction here and there. Yes, of course, but I will not be stopped and I'll certainly not be taken out. Then that reality cannot manifest in the reality that you're experiencing. So they can't kill you. They can't. It's not, it's not possible to, to, because they can't enter your reality. And if, you, if they can't do that, they can't influence your reality. The um, the other thing about standing up and speaking to large numbers of people, it's just, this is a really, really important point. The biggest prison that people live in that holds us in servitude and suppression more than any other is the fear of what other people think. Once we're in fear of what other people think, we're editing what we what we what we believe. We're editing what we say. We are going through mental gymnastics so that we are thinking, well, how can I put this in a way that this man won't think I'm crazy? Or how can I edit what I'm saying so this person will think I'm credible? Uh, that's what happens when you fear what other people think. And what you're doing is you're giving your power to other people. 
because you're saying what they think is dictating what you say and, and how you live your life. And if you say to most people, give me a list of five things, maybe even three, that you most frightened of, then in most people's list will be fear of speaking in public. Why? Because they fear what other people think. What will the audience say to me? Oh, oh, they, they're listening, so they must quite like me. And, and oh, oh, no, they're saying nasty things and someone's shouting out. Oh, oh, my goodness. That's got to go. If you say, this is my truth. I'm not asking anyone in this audience to believe a word of what I'm saying. I'm just putting information before them. And it's none of my business what they think of what I say, because if I think it's my business, then I think that I, I um, have a right to tell them what to think. That's nonsense. That's the old paradigm. We don't want to go that way. Here's some information. Make of it what you will. And I am totally at peace with what you make of it. Why? Because it's your right to make of it what you will. Not my uh, right to say you must believe it or you're wrong. So stage one, speak your truth unedited. This is me. I am free. This is me. Is what I have to say. And if you're not in any way concerned about how the people react to you, you're now in your power because you're now speaking your truth and not what you think other people think your truth should be. And you're not fearing the consequences of speaking your truth in, oh, what will they think of me? Because you you, 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 you know they have every right to think of you, whatever they choose to think of you. You want to hurl abuse at me? Feel free. I feel for you if you feel you need to hurl abuse, but feel free because I am me and this is my truth. And if you don't like it or well, do the other thing, that's fine by me. And what happens then is you can stand up in front of 10 people or 100,000 people without any nerves, without any fear, because... The dynamics has changed. You're speaking your truth. You, you're giving the audience the right to think of it, whatever they will. And because you're not in fear of what they will say to, uh, about you and you're secure in yourself that you don't need external confirmation of your power and your uh, sense of security and who you are, because you're getting that from within, not without. You don't need external things. This is why you see so many people in the enter entertainment industry like Hollywood and, and music and stuff are very insecure people because they're looking externally for confirmation that they're OK people. And they're all right people. Once you know that because you're infinite consciousness, you're just a, an expression of everything else. You are everything and everything else, as we all are in the end, um, then you don't need external security. You don't need people to saying, hey, Dave, you're a great guy. You're doing great things. It's nice when people say that, but you don't need it. And nor do you need the audience to react in a way that's positive to you. You need the audience to react in a way that they genuinely feel is right in the face of what you said. And that that what that means is you, you get your security and sense of self from within end of any fear of speaking in public or speaking in any public situation, gone. And, and, and that's, I, I would say, the way to approach it. Because before I had my transformation, well, in the, in the years before that, when I was a kid and, and, and a teenager and stuff, the thought of speaking in public, worst flipping nightmare, I tell you. Worst nightmare. Into my 20s, worst nightmare. And then after I, I went through my transformation, I, I don't care how many people there are. I, I don't, it doesn't matter because of the dynamics I'm talking about. And that's what, that's what people can do, everybody. We don't need to look to others for our security. We can get it from ourselves. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. I have goosebumps already. Um, there was one question that I had, and um, I don't know if you can point us to where we can find it, but Cherie and I uh, saw you in Santa Fe, and at the end of the presentation, you gave a speech uh, about, I think it was a voice that you heard. Um, where can we find that text? I don't know. I did, I did so many talks last year. I, <laughs> I, I, can't remember. I remember the Santa Fe one. I loved it. I, 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 I love that area in New Mexico. Okay. Yeah, oh, it was beautiful. It was amazing over there. Um, it said something well, about... I'm coming to America, uh, Chris. I'm, coming, I'm, going, I'm doing New York for the first time in October. 
which should be lively. Um, I'm doing San Francisco and Chicago as well in um, in October in America. Oh, excellent, excellent. And where can people find your book? Uh, DavidIke.com. Um, it's in transit at the moment. It'll be in the shops uh, in the UK and the US um, pretty shortly, but they can get it direct from um, DavidIke.com and, and it will be posted to their home. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Cherie, anything? Well, we just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, we really look up to you, uh, just in, as a couple and as a radio show. We we refer to you all the time. We and we really look up to you, and um, we encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Keep waking people up because you know how to do it in a way that really wakes people up and not just gives them a, a false awakening. So. Kudos to you. Yeah, thank you so well, much. Th- well, th- thank you very much for that. But you know, I'm I'm just infinite consciousness doing what I do, and you're infinite consciousness doing what you do, and and everyone else, and and you know, we we can all be all the things we think we can never be, because infinite consciousness is infinite possibility, and you know, it, it, the the little me era is vibrating out into history as I as I speak, and uh, it's it's a great time to be alive and. You know, th- this is my this is my life. Um, I I'm, I'm at this when I'm awake um, every uh, minute. Uh, and uh, people say, why don't, why don't you why don't you get something else in your life, Dave? And I say, this is my life. I don't want anything else. I don't want to sit on a beach. Good luck to people that do. I want I want to I want to pursue what I'm pursuing because I find it so fascinating uh, to see the the veil lift and what's been behind it and fascinating to see the true nature of what we are and what we're experiencing i mean it i mean cool i wouldn't want to be anything anyone else doing anything else than me doing what i'm doing and and uh, i get such such a, a great buzz and a joy from it and um so when i leave this reality at some point it will be in the moment of still doing what i'm doing i'll tell you retirement <laughs> are you kidding <laughs> Excellent. Thanks very much. It's been a real pleasure today. Thank you, David. Before Thank we let you, so you go, much. can we get a sound bite? Can you say you are tapped into the truth frequency with Chris and Cherie? Or even better, this is David Icke, and you are <laughs> tapped into the truth frequency with Chris and Cherie. Okay. Um, this is David Icke, and you're tapped into the truth frequency with Chris and Cherie. Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Everybody's clapping in the um, <laughs> chat room as well. David, you have a great day. Thank you so much for the wonderful broadcast. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely amazing interview. I hope everybody got their questions answered. There were a couple that we didn't get a chance to go over, but uh, David was short for time. He was only scheduled to be on for an hour. And, yeah, he uh, we gave actually, us two. He gave us two hours, so, um, so. very gracious with his time. And um, we'll see you. Let's see. What do we have coming up for Truth Frequency? Uh, um, this Thursday, down. we have Jim Mars coming on the broadcast at 7 o'clock Central. Then it's Saturday. On Saturday, we have Anti Illuminati. Anti Illuminati is a great researcher. He's not very well known, but uh, every time we have him on the broadcast, it's always amazing. On the 8th of May, which is Saturday, we're going to have Michael Tellinger, and he's going to get into some more Anunnaki um, and alien history. And then on the 15th, we have Barry Cooper, the uh, marijuana activist, former DEA agent. Uh, so that's going to be a great interview there. And we thank everybody in the chat room. Um, a lot of these names I just can't pronounce. <laughs> Yetz, Yetzira, Yetzira, thank you very much for joining us. Louisa, Buck, Bird. Um, All of you are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Jedi Mike, Zodiac, 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 <laughs> um, of course, Mike from Arizona, thank you very much for joining us. Rude Boy, um, Megan, and uh, everybody else. Amazing if I, turnout. Yeah, thank you so anybody, much for listening, you guys. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the numbers were great tonight. So we'll see you um, Thursday, 7 o'clock Central, and on Saturday, 7 o'clock Central, on American Freedom Radio. We're going to play one more David Icke clip, and then we'll wrap up the broadcast. We'll be right back. This is Truth Frequency with Chris and Cherie. <laughs> You ever heard that phrase, everyone knows that, mate? Well, why does everyone know that? Well, it's because this system is controlled by what I call repeaters. They're people in the situations of power and influence who just repeat what someone else tells them. A doctor is repeating what they were told at medical school and what the drug companies tell them. 
Uh, you've got teachers who repeat what they learned in their exams or what they learned at teacher training college and they repeat that to the next generation. And the great repeaters are what pass for journalists. This is the area outside uh, Parliament where they stand there doing their pieces to camera telling people what's going on. Here we have the uh, crews waiting for the journalists to come across from Westminster and stand there and tell them what's happening in the world. The fact is they don't know what's happening. They know nothing. So this is what they should be saying if they were telling the truth. Now over to Westminster for the latest news from David Icke. Thank you, you. Well, I haven't got a clue what's going on. I tell you what my job is, right? I, I wear a dark suit, not normally, but you know, I'm playing here. And I come over from there and I tell you what they told me is going on. And I deliver it as if I know what's going on and it's really true. I've got a clue if it's true. But they tell me, and they wouldn't lie, would they? Would Tony Blair lie about what's really happening? Would George Bush, please? I'm a journalist, trust me. And so, what we call news you, what you get paid a lot of money for reading Autocue about, is merely propaganda that they have told me and I tell you. David Icke, BBC, ITN, CNN, CBS, Sky News, Westminster. And welcome back to Truth Frequency. This is Chris and Cherie, and we just got done speaking with David Icke. It was an absolutely amazing two-hour broadcast, and we have something special for you right now. Uh, we're going to keep the broadcast going just a tad bit longer. On the line, we have our good friend Louis B. from Crotch Shot Radio, and I want uh, to tell everybody out there about Crotch Shot Radio. So, Louis, do we have you on the line? Oh, konnichiwa, everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> How you doing, Louis? Um, why don't you tell everybody out there, we've got a huge audience. Tell them about Crotch Shot Radio. Wow, you, you just called me on the spot. I just woke up, rolled out of bed. I still have, my breath still smells like fondue. Hey, how you doing, everybody? <laughs> Morning. Dude, it's like 3 p.m. <laughs> where you are. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what, Christy? Some people got dedication. I mean, did I call you Christy? I mean, yeah, Sherry. Did. That's okay. Oh, my goodness. See? <laughs> See, this is this is why everyone should start smoking more pot. It helps with your memory. <laughs> <laughs> well, Louis, tell everybody about um about Crush well, Shot. Well, Crush Shot Radio, it's um just think of it as a combination of Rush Limbaugh, Howard Stern, and uh, Alex Jones. I uh you know I I really. You know, I, I don't censor myself. It's an uncensored show. Uh, the reason why I named it Crowd Shot Radio was because the Nicey Nice Bunny Hour was taken. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, no, the, re the reason why I named it Crowd Shot Radio is because um, I am a uh, – I'm not afraid. I, you know, I, every every challenge I've ever taken uh, or was ever put in front of me, I, I took them on head on. And what is the most crippling attack in a fight? Well, it's, of course, a kick to the pants. It brings your enemy down quicker, and then you can do whatever you need to do to, to survive. And that's the name of it. I know a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about it. They say, oh, you talk about bad stuff on it because, you know, you're talking about, you know, genitals and stuff. No. They no, just no, have, no, they have a warped perspective is the problem. Yeah, I, I blame Britney Spears and all them other retards in Hollywood that that don't know how to wear any underwear. So I mean that's <laughs> that's, that's 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 my that's my only that's you know. But uh, you know, usually traditionally or originally the term crotch shot meant you're you're kicking someone in the pants, and that's that's how I like to do each and every show is more it's it's a frontal attack. I want I want you to like like how the New World Order likes to tell you what they're going to do, so that way when they do it, they could prove that they have no power. I like to attack the New World Order and anyone who is corrupt head on, so that way when when you know we win, they we could prove to them like there's nothing you could do either. You have no power. You are really you are the slaves. We are the masters. Exactly. Right. I've said that a hundred times. When does your show air and what is your website? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, my show airs Monday through Friday, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern on uh, crutchoutradio.com. Uh, check out uh, slash listen live. Also check out our, you know, just check out our site. You know, we, uh, we, I mean me. 
<laughs> you know, I, I post a lot of articles. I, I search for cool articles to, uh, to, uh, you know, aggregate, well, not aggregate. And also I do write my own articles as well. Um, it's just that I, I do a lot of stuff. So like, um, in fact, the uh, article that I posted is, uh, what the F is wrong with New Yorkers. Um, <laughs> Because they, they, there was this homeless man that saved this woman from uh, being robbed and in, in the process got himself stabbed. And as he's chasing the guy down and he collapsed and about 25 people from four in the morning and did this video four in the morning are passing him by just like, well, whatever. Wow. Until, and, and he, and well, he, obviously he died. Oh man. And so, I mean, it, 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 this kind of this kind of this this kind of angers me because I'm like, you know, all these all these movies are coming out about uh, regular people putting on masks and fighting crime and stuff, and I'm like, really, really, you, you I want to be able, I want to protect these people, these people that don't have no heart, don't don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I completely agree. Absolutely. So you're basically and fighting. ladies and gentlemen, you know, just a disclaimer, Crotch Shot is an edgy radio show. I mean, it's yeah. like, yeah, it, it's similar to Howard Stern with a political twist. Yeah, so like, yeah. You'll but hear weird. some cursing, you'll hear, yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah, you're going to you're going to hear me talking like a New Yorker. I mean, really, I I am I'm a Brooklyn boy and with all that means, I I don't I don't censor myself cuz I don't believe in censoring myself because I believe if you hold back to what you're really feeling, you weaken yourself. It's, um, you know, I, I've done shows on, uh, the, the importance of cursing and I, and how people say, oh, when you curse, you limit yourself. You're, you're, you're showing your, your ignorance, your stupidity. Well, I say, well, tell that to George Carlin. Tell that to Lenny Bruce. Tell that to, uh, Oh, what's his name? That other I keep forgetting his this comedian's name. Um, Richard Pryor. Well, yeah, him too, of course, of course. Richard <laughs> Pryor. Oh man. Yeah, that's one um, of the classics. But uh, what? No, he white guy. People say he looks like Alex Jones, or they say that he is Alex Jones. Bill Hicks. Bill Hicks. Bill, Bill Hicks. Yeah, he was a he was a legend of uh, of being able to use curse words, but still and. End up sounding intelligent. Yeah, I mean, say that, say that to those people. Say that to them. I use them with a purpose. Yeah, I might say them like three hundred times in the sentence, but you know, it's to emphasize my rage at, at a certain issue. It's it, it is you know. So that I mean that that's the point. I mean, it's not it's not it's not for kids. It's not for kids. So please be eighteen or older, or or seventeen and a <laughs> half, or perhaps sixteen if you. If you got a mustache, or fifteen so, with your parents' permission, or yeah, or, or, or twelve if you're naughty. So, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Great. Now, how long have you been doing the show? Uh, so far I've been doing it for two years. I was uh, one, I was on another network, uh, Blog Talk Radio, but I got kicked off because they didn't like me talking about nine eleven, and apparently they don't like it when uh, you say something bad about somebody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, so now now I am on TalkShoe, but everyone, if you want to listen in, uh, you know, TalkShoe.com, sign up there. But if you don't want to sign up, because I know a lot of people don't like putting their name on nothing, uh, yeah, it's CrackShotRadio.com slash listen live. You could go in, be anonymous, and uh, tell me I suck, and and <laughs> and be warned. Your mama might be, something about your mama might be said. I might tell the <laughs> truth about your mama. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, all right, and one more time, the show airs. You said Monday through Friday, yeah. seven o'clock Eastern. Yeah, some seven o'clock. Uh, okay. <laughs> great, great. I'm sorry, we caught you off guard. I know, but I I wanted to get you on so we can promote the show a bit. You have you've had us on several times, and we thank you for it. We actually hijacked your show the other day. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. But yeah, well, yeah, no, no, it, it, it kind of worked out for me because I, I was able to get some stuff done, and you know, you know, I, at one point I, you know, I went cooked myself, made myself a cook, I cooked myself a sandwich. <laughs> you cooked yourself a sandwich. I cooked, I cooked the sandwich. It's you know. Well, it's kind, it's kind of like David Icke, you know, you just press play and he just goes. 
He was yeah. a, he talks for th- 30 minutes. I could have gotten up, made a steak, french fries, everything came back. <laughs> but what he was saying is so profound, though. You're just stuck. Yeah, no, that's CrackShotRadio.com. Check us out every day. Um, yeah, we're, we're on iTunes, Zoom, Zencast. Just Google the Crutch Out Radio Show or Louis B. That's, that's me, your boy, your Puerto Rican boy from Brooklyn. Uh, you know, if you want to come on, let, let me know. Just Crutch Out Radio at Yahoo.com. And, uh, yeah, just be sure. Just, just take a listen. Take Excellent. A listen. Ha- have an open mind and, you know, you hate me. Keep listening anyways. <laughs> Excellent. We appreciate you uh, coming on last minute like this. And ladies and gentlemen, this has been Truth Frequency with Chris and Cherie. We'll see you on Thursday, 7 o'clock Central, and Saturday, 7 o'clock Central at TruthFrequencyRadio.com. Y'all have a great day, and thank you so much for tuning in. Cast the ways, outlaws to the game like Thomas Payne once they masquerade us. Who's to blame us now? Set to explode like a hand grenade does. No peace to cease the police to show peace. Unleash peace, no release peace. Underneath the beast that lies dormant, forced to use force, torn to use caution. Tossed to the ground like a subliminal blinded, like ARS 1, cause I'm criminal minded. I run with soldiers amongst the vultures, now you're under control. Cause you do what they told you. the front lines now, we're living the battle. Slowly I walk through the valley of shadow And there's no man that's gonna keep me down To the thief, to the king when he snaps the crown